Hi there, it's Chris Walsworth here. I'm in my recording studio. Well, it's the wardrobe, really, but it's the quietest place in the house. The feedback from my first video last month, Rosalie's Bequest, was very encouraging, and people are now asking for more. So here goes. This one is a story about a painting I never handled and I never sold, but it's the painting that changed my life. When Michael and I were moving back north to Cumbria in 1986, we told the agents we were looking for a three or four bedroomed house, possibly a cottage, rural with views. And we spent months looking at and losing properties from the place we'd rented near Cockermill. One summer morning, when we were despairing of ever finding the right place, the post arrived with this brochure in it. Michael had a look at the brochure, glanced through it, and tossed it into the bin. They don't listen, do they, he said in despair. That is a huge Georgian listed, at least eight bedrooms, in the centre of Cockermouth. Are they crazy? When he left for work, I fished it out of the bin and thought I'd go and view it. I've always lo loved Georgian houses and had nothing else much to do. Michael was right, though. It was very, very big and very pink. And worst of all, it had fake pink Tyrolean shutters nailed on to the exterior wall round all the windows. It was on a busy road and it needed a lot of work. But the walled garden at the back was gorgeous. I had cursory glances into all these rooms out of politeness. There, was, there were attics and cellars and pantries and a sewing room. The heating and electrics were clapped out. They called the last room I went into the library, which was a bit pretentious, I thought, getting ready to escape, until I noticed this large painting above the bookshelves. It was a huge panorama of a Cumbrian coastal village, and it was magnificent. It stopped me in my tracks like a body blow. I couldn't take my eyes off it. I had no idea where it was, but it didn't matter. It was about seven feet wide and three or four feet tall. I couldn't see a signature. That's probably because there wasn't one. I found out later. Who painted that? I casually asked the owner, trying not to show too much excitement. Um, a man called Percy Kelly, I think, she said. Is he local? Yes, he, he's from Workington. He's a postman, I think. I wanted to see more of his work. I wanted that painting. Well, I wanted the house as well, but it was out of the question. Or was it? I left and walked down the hill as if sleepwalking into the Midland Bank and picked up a leaflet I'd seen there last time I was in. How to write a business plan. I spent the next few days doing just that. I'd taught art for some years and run a small graphic design business. I'd never written a business plan before, though. But I made an appointment for a second viewing of Castlegate House the following Saturday. We did a bit of shopping, Michael and I, that following Saturday morning, and then we set off up the hill in the direction of Castlegate House, and I told him about a painting I'd seen that was absolutely wonderful. He cottoned on straight away. He stopped in his tracks. Look, Chris, he said, we need to buy a house, not a painting. I said, look, you might like to look inside this garden. We went inside. The garden door was open, the sun was shining, and I led him out. We sat on a bench for a while. It was lovely. The roses, the smell of roses, and the poppies, and everything. The bees. It was wonderful. I've always wanted a walled garden, Michael said dreamily. I was home and dry, nearly. As we walked back, to the, through the back door into the hall. He noticed the lovely little ditty over the door. I don't think Wordsworth wrote it. And there was the date above that the house was built, 1739. And the ditty said, I love this dear old house because it offers after dark a pause for rest, a rest for pause, a place to moor my bark. We went for a coffee. He said to me, you're not 
you're not definite about wanting, you're not serious about wanting us to buy this house, are you? That's when I fished in my handbag and showed him my business plan. He sat and read it for some time. Can you make this gallery idea work, he said. Yes, I answered, far more confidently than I felt. We bought Castlegate House. We moved in. The painting of Parton was gone, of course. I assumed it had gone to the owner's new house in far, far away in the south of England. And the renovations began. I spent nine crazy months getting planning permission for change of use, overseeing builders and looking for artists. All the time in the back of my mind, I was trying to find a man called Percy Kelly, a postman who painted like an angel. I opened the doors as a gallery on the 7th of July, 1987. It's nine months exactly since we would bought Castlegate House and people flocked. I think it was just such a lovely place to have a gallery in. And I had, I was doing something a little bit different. I'd planned a whole year of separate exhibitions. And so it was quite enticing to come and see something new every month. This is the Adam room. It has a perfect Adam ceiling. And this is the garden room, which looks out into that enchanted garden. And I was inundated with artists. They were bringing stuff in and ringing and sending fat envelopes by post. I took on an assistant, Wendy, and we sifted through together. Just a few months after the opening, the wife of a consultant at the local hospital approached me. Do you think we could hold the AGM of the Medical Benevolent Fund here, Chris? Maybe on the day you closed? It's followed by lunch and we all bring that. Don't think you'll have anything to do. I agreed. There were a lot of people and it had spread my net wider. After the business, she fetched me from my office, tapped on the door. Chris, do you think you could come down and talk about the gallery? They're all interested. I did. And then it was question time. There were a few expected questions. And then, how do you find your artists, someone asked. Those I don't want beat a pathway to the door, I said. And those I do want, I really have to work at. I go to exhibitions and galleries and read arts magazines. There are, there are lists that Northern Arts and the Scottish Royal Academy have. I aim for the top, you know. But there's one artist I've been looking for for over a year. I'm wondering whether any of you have heard of him. He's local. He's an artist from Workington. His name's Percy Kelly. There was a restive murmur. It felt a little bit odd. I looked around eagerly. So if anyone knows how I can find him, Anne the chair leapt to her feet. Thank you so much, Chris. This is a lovely place to hold a meeting. I hope you'll have us again. And now it must be time for lunch. There was a round of applause and people made their way through to the kitchen. Anne kept me back. I hope you're joining us for lunch, Chris. I think everybody enjoyed that bit of an insight into running a gallery. But can I have a word in your ear? A few years ago, Percy Kelly ran away with one of the surgeon's wives. She took their three children with her. And that surgeon's here today. Gosh, I said, he'll know where they're living, won't he? Will you point me out to him? I've got to find Kelly and I'll be ever so tactful. Oh, no, said Anne, looking at me sternly. Nobody talks about it. It was quite a scandal. He's happily remarried, but the memory is still raw. There was a lot of gossip when it happened. Speculation as to why she would leave a surgeon who'd just had a lovely new house built for a penniless artist. Please don't ask him. None of us talk about it. It's taboo, Chris. Everything happened in the gallery kitchen. It was the hub of the house and the hub of the business. Lots of people still tell me their impressions, maybe when they had tea in there or met the artist. Lots of people said they longed to be invited into the kitchen. The word went round between artists anyway, and I was inundated with approaches. This was years before the World Wide Web or computers or emails. Everything arrived by post, thick pa packages, 
often with insufficient postage, or by telephone, or I manage to stop artist, artists hauling things in all the time. Wendy would sort out the post on the kitchen table. One day I was walking through and she'd isolated a, a little pile of photographs. Hey, look at this, she said. I looked at them. They were lovely photos from a potter, Chris Hawkes. Beautiful raku pots. I looked at the address. Hmm, Wales. I wondered why he'd written to us. Will you ring him and find out how he, mani how he can manage to get the work to us, Wendy? Wendy came back. Hey, you'll never guess. He's a woman, Chris Hawkes. She said she used to live in Cumbria. She has friends she comes to see regularly near here. She says she can bring pots to show you next week. Chris Hawkes was delightful. A lovely person and lovely pots. Young, mid-forties, she was staying with a friend who came to the gallery who had told her to send her photos to me. We spread her pots out on the kitchen table and I decided I wanted to keep them all. She gave me the price list. They were very well priced. Chris Hawkes was the sort of artist it was a pleasure to deal with. She was modest, sensible, organised and friendly. Sitting in the garden with a cup of tea afterwards, she looked around wistfully and said how much she missed Cumbria. She had real longing in her eyes. Can't you come back here to live, I said. No, I burned my boats, I'm afraid. I did something awful. Oh, surely it couldn't have been that bad, Chris. Oh, it was, she said. I ran away with someone. There's no going back now. My hair stood on end. Could it be? It was a long shot, but I had to ask. Er, uh, Chris, was that artist you ran away with? What Was he a postman? Well, sort of, she shrugged. Was he from Workington? Uh, a long time ago. I was so excited I wasn't reading her face or her body language at all. Was it Percy Kelly? Silence. I tell you what, Chris, a joint exhibition of your pots and his work, which I love, would be... He's not with you, is he? She was on her feet. Her face was blank. I've got to go. We're not together now. Didn't work. Goodbye. I've left the price list on the table and I look forward to showing with you. Good luck with the pots. And she went. About two or three years passed. It was a long time and my search for Percy Kelly was totally fruitless. And that was the day that Joan David came in. Here she is, not on the first day she came to the gallery, but when I'd got to know her a bit more, sitting in the garden at Castlegate House. She'd read my articles on that day she first came in. She'd, it, in Cumbria Life magazine, which was new then. She was in her 60s, she was a retired scientist and she lived in Kendal. She was passionate about art. She was very stylish, with a jaunty hat, pink pixie boots, modern jewellery. I liked her immediately. She bought two pieces of studio glass on that first visit. And as she was leaving, she turned and said, um, Have you ever heard of an artist called Percy Kelly? Well, I could hardly believe my ears. I could hardly breathe. But was this going to end in disappointment again? Yes, I have, I said. I love his work. I've been searching for him for a long time. Do you know how I can get in touch with him? Oh, yes, she said. He writes to me. He's in Norfolk. Well, two hours later, in a cheese salad and several cups of tea, I'd at last got the story. Only some of it, though, but I didn't know that at the time. And an invitation to lunch on the following week to her house to look at her letters, which she said were fabulous. I couldn't wait. Joan's three-storey house was in a stone terrace by St George's Church in Kendal. It looked across the green to the river. It was a beautiful setting. Inside, the house was full of treasures. Joan was an avid collector and supported local artists, buying their work whenever she could. As I passed the door into the sitting room, it was open, I could see a large, dark, charcoal drawing that turned my heart into somersaults. 
Come into the kitchen, she called. The coffee's on. Her kitchen walls were hung with framed paintings. I looked closer. No, they weren't paintings. They were letters. Letters like I'd never seen before. The writer had painted a watercolour on a sheet of A4 and had then written the letter on it. They bore the hallmark of the artist who had painted the massive apartment panorama and the artist who made the picture that was in her sitting room. These are the letters I told you about, she said calmly. Aren't they lovely? Look, here's one of the envelopes. He even painted on the envelopes. I wasn't calm at all. I was speechless. In the sitting room, she produced a folder. It was full of letters from Percy. There were hundreds. Look, she said, here's the first letter he ever sent to me. I wrote to him after I saw a painting in my friend Mary's house. I wanted one really badly. She gave me the artist's address with the warning that he didn't like to sell his work unless he was absolutely broke or if he liked you. And she warned me that he didn't like many people anyway. He was living with his wife near Attleborough in Norfolk. Ooh, I thought that must be the potter I'd met. So said Joan, I wrote and said I'd like to buy a painting. I laid on the flatter in the admiration and I got this letter by return. It was dated 24th of January 1983. That's Joan with her lovely folder full of letters from Percy. It was very fat as you can see and there must have been hundreds of letters there at that point and there were more to come. Here is the first letter that he wrote to her on the 24th of January 1983. So what happened next, I asked. Well, I replied, said Joan, and I enclosed a book of stamps. And so began years of intense correspondence. It's all here and they're still coming. This one arrived yesterday and she handed me the folder. He sometimes writes two or three times a week. Now I don't stop. I've been tempted to now and again. But the trouble is, I love getting these letters and he knows it. He hinted at times when he thought I was giving up that he'd written or sent Christmas cards to people who hadn't replied immediately and he'd cut them off. It was a sort of threat. So I took the hint and even replied when I was on holiday in Canada seeing my daughter or in Iceland or anywhere. After about ten letters she carried on telling me and I was fascinated. My friend Rhett, Mary rang. Well, the letters had stopped for about a week. And I thought, oh, well, that's it. I should just treasure the ones I've got. But my friend, friend Mary rang me and she said, Percy's wife has suddenly left him. I think you've got to ring him, Joe. He's suicidal. I'm worried. I said, but I hardly know him. I've never met him. Well, said Mary, somebody has to. And I haven't got the time. You're writing to him. Do it. Well, I wrote to him immediately, said Joan. And then I rang. He was in a very bad state. I wanted to go and see him, but I didn't want to go on my own. I asked Mary to come to Norfolk with me and told her I would do the driving in my polo. I would no idea what we'd find. What was it like, I asked. Well, said Joan, I knew exactly what the cottage looked like and Magpie Lane, as in this painting that he sent me. But inside and outside, it was really chaotic. He'd chopped his toe the day before, trying to mow the lawn, and the whole place was in a mess. He was sleeping on a camp bed in the downstairs room. There were paintings everywhere. I'd booked us in a B&B &B nearby. I'd taken two hampers of food. I gave one to Percy when we arrived. He was very grateful, but he seemed to forget about it. He offered to make tea, but he kept forgetting. And the raven was falling apart, and the kettle never boiled. So he poured it into dirty cups, and it was tepid. By three o'clock, we were so hungry, we went back to the B&B, &B, and we opened the other hamper, and ate choked cold chicken and had a G&T from, the other, from the other hamper. I tried to mow the lawn next day, but the grass was too long. I'd noticed when looking through her letters that the first letter 
was formal, to Dear Miss David and signed Percy Kelly. This soon became Dear Joan and was signed Yours Bob, because his name was Robert Percy and he preferred Bob with friends. But I noticed that some of them recently were signed Roberta. I wonder if that, wondered if that was an accident, a sort of flourish at the end, a sort of added A by mistake. When I asked Joan about this, she became a little coy. He had told her before her first visit that he had a female persona, Roberta. And after Chris had left him, Joan helped him change his name to Roberta Penelope to match his existing initials. As an artist, he was emphasising he would always be Percy Kelly. He loved to dress up rather like Grace and Perry. But he was born about 50 years too soon. She then showed me the photograph taken by her friend when she tried to mow the lawn for him, which you've just seen. I was enthralled. I now had his address. Pear Tree Cottage, Magpie Lane, Rockland St Peter, Norfolk. It was on most of the letters. I was so excited. I'm going to clear my diary, I said to Joan, and I'll go and see him. Would you like to come with me? Joan looked horrified. No, no, Chris, that's no good. He'll not let you in. He hates gallery people. He hates showing anybody his work. He's turned down over the years some of the best art dealers in the country. When I go, and I've only been twice, he shows me just a few selected paintings, even though they're stacked everywhere. He sleeps in a camp bed downstairs because there are paintings all over his bed, apparently, and blocking the stairs. He can't get up there anymore. He told me about a dealer who came and actually touched a piece of his work. He told me this as a sort of warning. The dealer had lifted it slightly to see the one below. So Percy sent him away and he doesn't let anybody in anymore. It's really hard not to look at everything. You would have such trouble, Chris. He'd be dying to, to, to look through the pile. You've got to write to him. That's his preferred way of communication. Tell you what, I'll write first. I'll do it tonight and I'll mention you. And I, I'll enclose some of the articles you've written about art and artists in Cumbria. And then you can write, and we'll see what happens. I left with my head full of all the wonderful images I'd seen. Well, the reply Joan got was all about the articles I'd written, which he dismissed, making critical comments about all the artists I'd written about. Nothing about me or the gallery, except to mention that I'd written to him. She tried again. He said it was interesting that someone was starting a gallery in Cockermouth of all places. He said it was destined to failure in West Cumbria and he said the woman must have plenty of money to do it. He said I must have a private income. Ha! <laughs> I wish. I followed it up but neither of us had much home. hope. His reply to me was all excuses. He said he was on a supplementary benefit and didn't want to earn anything and hazard it. One of the letters, he said... I cannot paint for monetary gain, but when I have departed this world, I should like the world to see what I have created, which gave me just a smidgen of hope. My letters were illustrated, but just with a black line of print. He didn't want me to be able to sell it, I guess, as if I would. He near it nearly did literally starve, Joan told me. He'd recently collapsed and was found by neighbours who called an ambulance. He was taken to hospital and lots of tests were done, but nothing could be found until a doctor diagnosed malnutrition. He was fed a high-calorie diet for a few weeks, during which time he washed all his plastic plates, got a friend to bring his paints in and decorated them. You saw some, a couple dedicated to Joan on the page before. So, at last I'd found the painter of the Parton panorama, but I was no nearer to getting hold of any of the work. As I got to know Joan more, and a real friendship was established, we discussed at length what would happen when Percy died. Joan was really worried about his health, which was very poor. He told Joan that he'd made a will and was leaving all his work to her, as she'd know what to do about it. 
but he really didn't think he would die. It was not a concept he could imagine. June and I discussed this. She realised that she might need me to fulfil her plans when she'd inherited all this work. She had no idea how much work there was in the cottage, and we got together to make a plan in which a core exhibition of his work would be selected to be kept for posterity. Joan thought a building, maybe a house in Workington, where property was very cheap. If I sold enough of the rest at the gallery to purchase it, and then enough to invest and cover maintenance, that would, that would be a good solution. It would be a Percy Kelly museum. But the immortal Percy had cried wolf too many times with the medics, and he died of throat cancer just a few months after our conversation. This photograph, above, was taken on a Sunday morning in July 1993. I was preparing for the opening of our summer exhibition. The garden was full of beautiful sculptures, as you can see, and inside the gallery there were paintings of gardens and flowers and stuff like that. As I was doing the final touches to everything, you know, dusting down that lion made out of fo uh, motorbike parts, the phone rang. I rushed inside and it was Joan. Hello, Joan, I said. How are you? She was in hospital recovering from a hip replacement. Percy died last night, she said. David Raleigh was with him. David was a gentleman farmer, a neighbour, and his wife Jackie had befriended him. David had told Joan that he and Jackie would organise the funeral. Joan couldn't go, of course. I was launching a new exhibition, and she and I spent hours on the phone, waiting to see what would happen. A will was never found. There were several which had been started but never finished or signed or dated. It's typical Percy. A solicitor in North Norwich who had tried to help him had urged him to get his will signed and finished, but it just hadn't happened. This solicitor began to trace who was the next of kin. He was liaising with Joan and the Raleighs. Time passed. Joan rang. There's a son, Joan said, and there's a twin brother. He never talked about them at all. I've met John, his twin. He's a nice man. But I had no idea he had a son. He's called Brian. They turned up to the funeral and the solicitor had got in touch. We agreed that his son Brian should be found at all costs. Joan was still immobile. She became Miss Marple and I was her runner and we had to work fast. The Raleighs were kind and generous but not into art at all. They just knew that the cottage was in a mess with stuff everywhere. All we knew was that the son Brian lived somewhere in Cumbria. That was good news. Joan rang again. Percy's first wife's still alive, Chris. Track her down. How could I start tracking down? But the phone went again very soon. It was Joan again. The wife lives in Cockermouth, she said. I found out a lot more. She goes for coffee with her mates every Tuesday morning at 11 at Norham House. Do you know where Norham House is? Yes, I said, I do. It's the other end of town. Do we have a name? Is she still Mrs Kelly? Oh no, she remarried, said Joan. What's her name then? Do you know? Yes, her name's Ark. Audrey Ark. What? A-R-K, as in Noah? Yes, said Joan. It's a bit funny, but that's what they said. OK, I'll do it, I said. Well, I didn't have to. The next day, Saturday, I was in the kitchen when Wendy came in and shut the door behind her and leant against it. What I said? It's Percy's first wife, said Wendy. Where? In the gallery. I stood up. What's she like? Wendy just shrugged, smiled and opened the door for me and ushered me through. The woman waiting in the Adam room was sporting a dark bouffant wig topped with a silver baseball cap huge dark sunglasses and a pink fleece. The silver trainer completed the picture. I walked forward smiling, hand outstretched. How lovely to meet you, Mrs. Ark. The name's Park, she growled. Whoops, Joan's hearing must be going. She was carrying a plastic bag that looked interesting. 
Oh, I'm so pleased you've come, I said. I really love your late husband's work. Art, she said, I've had it up to here, an indicator somewhere above her head. And she started on the shortcomings of her late ex-husband. People in the gallery were gathering in the room, pretending to look at the paintings. Well, he may have been a good artist, she said. How am I to know? But as a man... Um, would you like a tea or coffee, Mrs Park, I said, ushering her out towards the kitchen. The people in the gallery cast disappointed glances in my direction. I was depriving them of the entertainment. In the kitchen, she said she brought some pictures to show me and tipped out the contents of the Tesco bag. They were amateur drawings of a woman. They weren't very good. She thought they might be worth something. She'd pick them up in a second hand shop. Have you any of your ex-husband's work? I said, hopefully. No, she said, I hate it. And she left. But only I'd asked her, after I'd asked her to tell her son Brian to come and see me. She wouldn't give me any contact details. She just said she'd tell him to come. I called after her as she left. Tell him to be quick as soon as possible, will you? Brian came. I've put this nice picture of Lowe's water up here because I have I apologise, I don't have any pictures of Brian. He was far too shy and private and nervous, so I never managed to get a snap of him. But he was tall and handsome like his father, but his chiselled features belied his, back of any, his lack of any resolve and he smelled strongly of drink. He was very nervous and it at ease. He saw me as a very posh lady, and he didn't trust me at all. He stood there moving from foot to foot. He told me he'd been to his father's funeral. He said he'd been to see his father in hospital in Norwich the week before. His dad died, and his dad had leapt out of bed and bounded up the ward and said there's nothing wrong with me. Next minute he was dead, said Brian. I found this hard to believe. Brian had what I came to know as a permanently puzzled expression. After some gentle pressure, it was gentle, honest, he told me that he hadn't seen his father for 27 years. He'd left school at 16, joined the Merchant Navy, and when he came home, his father wasn't there. He'd gone off with somebody. Brian never found out who that somebody was. He'd never tried to get in touch. He had no idea where his father was either. Brian was a man without any curiosity. He told me he hated his job on the production line of a factory in Silleth and wanted to leave. He told me he was hoping to sell Peartree Cottage for a lot of money and retire. He was in his late forties. I tried to tell him that his father's work was worth an awful lot of money, much more than the cottage, but he clearly didn't believe me. A man who had never owned a property in his life thought property was king. He said he was going down to Norfolk the next weekend with his wife to sort things out. I again emphasised the importance of the work. That was the best I could do. Joan and I were troubled. We knew he would clear the house, but what could we do? We were on pins. We were terrified. Two weeks later, he turned up with his wife, Doreen. A sensible red-haired red -haired woman who was friendly and intelligent. I saw her as an ally, and she was. She'd gone down with Brian to Pear Tree. She said it was in a terrible mess. She'd seen it briefly after the funeral, so she'd gone to the funeral with Brian. And she'd been doing all the cleaning and clearing. Probate had been a simple matter, when I inquired, as there was only Brian, no valid will, and very little of value. What? Joan didn't think anyone had been asked to value the paintings. Little did we know. I'll tell you that story in another, in another video. At this point, Brian, who still smelled even more strongly of drink, blurted out, You know them paintings? I'm bringing them up here. Then I'm going to sell the cottage. He was still banking on the value of his broken down building which had suffered at the hands of Percy's lamentable do-it-yourself skills. Was this the man who'd been full of suspicion and mistrust last time he was here? It was two years later that I discovered what had brought this sea change about. How are you going to get 
all that stuff here, Brian, I said. In me mini, he said. I exchanged horrified looks with Doreen. Brian, they won't fit, she said. I realised at that moment that he only saw anything in a frame hanging on a wall as a picture. And what will you do with it all then, Brian, I asked innocently. I'll take it home, he said. Now it was Doreen's turn again. Brian, where are you going to put it? There's masses of it. It won't go in the car either. I'll put it under bed, he said. That's when Doreen flew off the handle. Don't be so ridiculous, Brian. Then she turned to me to ask my opinion. I took them up to the large attic on the second floor. We stood and looked round this large, empty space. The best thing is to get the professionals in, I said. Your dad deserves it, Brian. I can get an art carrier to pick it all up in Norfolk and bring it up here. I'll get a photographer to come and photograph every piece and then you can come in and decide what to do. How much will that cost, said Brian. Nothing, Brian, I said. I'll cover it. But seeing his face, I quickly added, you'll not be under any obligation to me. I mean that. You can then do what you like, but at least it'll be back in Cumbria and it will be safe. Brian, it is your dad's lifetime's work. It must be kept safe. Oh, thank you, Chris, said Doreen. After the funeral, before we knew about the will and everything, Brian was talking about burning everything because he can't sell the house with all that stuff blocking everything. Store it up here, I said. My regular art carrier in Newcastle agreed to return in the, up the M1 on their next trip from London and divert to Norfolk and pick up all the art in the cottage. Brian was so secretive. He was as secretive as his dad and he didn't want me to go down to the cottage. So I emphasised that every piece of artwork, everything stashed away in boxes, drawers, all of it had to come north to the carrier. It was agreed that it would be with me at the gallery late the following Wednesday afternoon. That Wednesday I was nervous all day. By five o'clock I was pacing up and down as, as I locked the gallery up for the day. Mobiles were rare then, as heavy as bricks. I was even more anxious as it started to get dark. It was September and I was so glad when the van pulled into the car park at eight o'clock. Jack the driver staggered in and I put the kettle on. How's it gone, Jack? Terrible, he said. Oh, in what way? How much did you insure it all for, said Jack? Oh, come on, Jack, that's between the boss and me. Why, has something happened to it? No, he said, but what did you insure it for? Oh, all right then. I didn't know what to put on it, Jack. I've put 40,000 on it. He took another gulp of tea, looked at me closely as though I was totally daft and said, look, Chris, it's taken me all day to load it and it's a load of bloody rubbish. I roared out to the van, Jack behind me and my husband, Michael, anxiously following. Jack opened the back doors and the sight was unbelievable. The large van was stuffed full of what appeared to be rubbish. There were two tapestries to the right, neatly packed and addressed to the Lane Gallery in Newcastle from the V&A and four cratered paintings from the Tate Gallery destined for the Scottish National Gallery in Edinburgh on the left. And the rest was junk. Paint tins, bread trays, old paint brushes and fish boxes, paint rags as well as tatty rolls of wallpaper, loads of them. There was nothing I could see that even faintly resembled paintings. I clambered on the back of the van and lifted the first piece of paper. There was a painting underneath. I lifted it a bit further. It said Lowe's Water, Percy Kelly, 1985, 1965, sorry, on the other side. I looked at the next one. It was mounted on a piece of newspaper that had been pasted on the back. It was an aerial view of Whitehaven Harbour. The next one, I had no idea where it was, but it was gorgeous. Tears began to flow and I couldn't speak. I was shaking. 
This was what I'd been working for. Since 1986, when I saw my first Kelly, all I could think of was, wait until Joan sees this lot. Jack stretched up to help me down, and he put his arm round my shoulder gently. I'm sorry, pet, he said. I did try to warn you. I knew you'd be upset. The rest of it's all the same junk, you know. That started me off. Again. Jack didn't know what to do. Weeping women were well above his pay grade. Well, the whole of this whole day was. I think it was the pent-up energy, but I started to jump about, up and down, and clap. I grabbed hold of Jack and twirled him round, and told him he was wonderful, and told him the work was just what I'd imagined. And I said to him, if he helped to unload it now, I'd make him a bacon sandwich. In fact, I might even make him two. And that was the culmination of all my dreams, as well as seven years of hard work. But the really hard work was just about to begin. We carried everything up to the attic studio. In the next weeks, I sorted everything out into heaps, and then I got two photographers to photograph every piece and employed someone to list it all. Then I invited Joan to come and see. She was out of hospital, but she couldn't drive. I got Mavis Aitchison, who lived in Kendall, and had known Percy to drive her up. And Michael carried her upstairs, and Mavis and I paraded paintings in front of her. It was like the selection committee at the RA. We had a picnic lunch up there. Joan had seen the poppy head painting go past, and she requested that it was put behind her when I took these photographs. She joined the queue at the first exhibition, and she bought it. Joan's son, Rob, showed me the photograph of it in Pear Tree on one of Joan's visits. That, that painting has now been bequeathed to Tully House Museum and Gallery in Carlisle. And Rob, it took Rob a long time to show me that because he was embarrassed because it was um, not focused. But you can clearly see per Percy there in one of his outfits. And of course, ironically, there is the painting Joan wanted. She'd loved it from the first time she saw it on that visit. Now it was Brian's turn. Well, here are some of the paintings, sorry, that that, um, that Mavis and I walked past Joan. That's the really famous one of Lawton and the White House. There's the bridge looking out at the fish yards in Allenby. Percy must have sat on that bank to draw it and paint it. And Glen Cottage, where he lived, was just the other side of the road. And there's a painting that was been a mystery to me for years until I did the um, Percy Kelly trails. And then I at last discovered it when I was driving up the road from Allenby further north. And there was that farm. It looked a bit different, but it was unmistakably that painting. So it was now Brian's turn. I gave him a copy of everything and asked Brian what he wanted to do. And I gave him choices, three choices. The first was Joan and my plan of retaining a core collection and selling the rest. He frowned. Couldn't get his head round that idea. Sell it all, he said, so it was pretty obvious. Happened there'll be some at left, he said. Number two was that I'd buy everything. But in fact, I had my fingers crossed behind my back because I didn't have the wherewithal to buy everything. I would have, if that's what he'd gone for, I would have, I would have um, done it and raised the money somehow. But I think it was in his own interest that it should sell because it would gain in, in value as it went along. So number three was that I'd sell everything for him on commission. How long will that take? said Brian. He thought I could sell everything on commission straight away and then he could retire. I said we had to have a longer term plan, say five exhibitions with two years between each one. His face dropped. He obviously needed ready cash. The house sale wasn't going well at all, I discovered later. It was a mess and Brian had to keep driving it to Norfolk. In fact, it took more than three years to sell the house. Michael was lo loitering in the background. He suggested a compromise, 
as he could see Brian's dilemma and his need for ready cash. We had some of he had some redundancy money, and he said he would buy two random piles right now for cash. Asked Brian eagerly. Michael looked at him and said, "Yes, two random bread trays, Brian, one of decent paintings and one of tatty old sketches. The unfinished ones in that tray out over there." I'll keep mine back until everything of yours has sold. And they made a legal agreement. Brian wasn't very keen on the legal bit, but Michael felt that they both needed it for their own protection. This is the catalogue for the first exhibition. It was on May in May 1994, and there was a queue for the opening. A hundred works, everything sold. Brian moved on from beer to spirits and hard drugs, and he died in the fourth exhibition in 2000 of alcoholic poisoning. He was age 54. He left everything to his 78-year-old mother, Audrey, who hated the work. Each exhibition I've mounted of Percy Kelly's work has brought more enlightenment and added to the story. People who'd known a bit of the story came and told me lots of things I didn't know. I wrote it all down, and much of it's revealed in my book, The Man Who Couldn't Stop Drawing. But best of all, it connected me with that first painting I saw, Parton Looking North. You, wonder, you were wondering when I was going to get back to this painting, weren't you? A man with the wonderful name of Harry Fancy came in and introduced himself. I'm Harry Fancy, he said, and I'm in charge of the Whitehaven Museum. And I've got the Kelly in there. The Seckers had left Parton, looking north, on loan to the museum when they sold the house to us and left. So all this time that I'd been looking for Percy, that painting was closer than I ever imagined. Harry Fancy asked me down to the museum to see it. And that was the first time I'd set eyes on it again since my viewing of the house. When the beacon opened in 1996 on the quayside at Whitehaven, I curated the opening exhibition in the gallery there of works by Percy Kelly in their beautiful custom-built gallery. And of course, I wanted the part and painting as part of it. I was really pleased to know that Copeland Council and negotiated the, pay, the purchase of the Parton Panorama from the second, from the Seckers, from whom we'd bought the house. When I chased the, the Parton painting again for the retrospective at Tully House, Carlisle, in 2017-18, it wasn't at the Beacon. I rang the Beacon to ask if I could borrow it, and they said, well, we don't know where it is. I went shooting down, driving down to Whitehaven. I was so anxious about where it had disappeared to. I talked to the manager at the museum and he said, I think it might be in the council offices. They weren't very far away, so we walked round there. And having worked through the place, we found it hanging in the chief executive executive's office of Copeland Council. It's now on public view in the Beacon. If you want to see it, I think sometimes it's on show and otherwise you can request to see it in advance. So, what would have happened to the work of Percy Kelly if I hadn't seen that one painting and started a search for the artist? It wouldn't have made any difference to his own life as he was determined to live a life of poverty and he had become a recluse. He'd turned his back on all those who previously helped him and believed in his art. He lived and socialised through his letters. He'd managed very successfully to disappear, leaving no traces, as I found to my cost. Nobody around him in Norfolk knew he was an artist with huge potential. Joan David was the link, but she was unable to do anything at the time of his death, and his estranged son Brown would still have inherited by default and cleared the house of all the rubbish as he perceived it, it took several more years for Pear Tree Cottage to sell. Since Kelly's death, several more collections of his work and letters have come to light. There have been many exhibitions at Castlegate House, 
and at the Beacon, and at Messon's Cork Street, London, the Cider Press, Dartington, the Pencil Museum, Keswick, and as a fundraiser for Theatre by the Lake in Keswick, as well as the big impressive retrospective at Tully House in 2017-18. I bought letters from Joan's David's neighbour, Jane, in 1992. Joan died in 2000, just before her 80th birthday. I still miss her, you know. And there was a big exhibition of her letters in 2002. Her two children kept a core collection, which is now in the Cumbrian Archive, and appointments can be made to see them. Audrey Park discovered 26 oil paintings in her loft. Chris Hawkes gave her collection to her three children. The eldest stepdaughter, Kim, had an exhibition of her letters. And just when we thought that that was the end, a cache of his small works were discovered in a wardrobe in Wales, still parcelled up as Percy had posted them, with do not opens still intact all over it. And Percy's younger brother, Douglas, sold me a collection of beautiful small works in 2018. A small exhibition was mounted at the settlement in Maryport last year alongside letters that he'd written to Norman Nicholson, the poet. All this alongside smaller collections I've acquired, sourced from people who knew him. I've been granted access to private collections, including those to Lord Eccles and to Mavis and Dr Charles Aitchison. Having stated many times, after the first five exhibitions of Brian's inherited collection, that this is the last exhibition I have, I have to eat my words. I don't say that anymore because I believe there may still be some su surprises left. I hope so. Percy's work was saved through the kindness, generosity and huge perseverance of Joan David. My life and that of many others has been enhanced by this man. I would never have started the gallery without seeing that painting in Castlegate House. Percy Kelly was the man I never met, but I feel I knew him very, I know him very, very well. <laughs>